The 3,000 year occupation span at the Maya site of Lamini is well known. Like several other sites in north central Belize, particularly those on waterways, Lamini survived the transition from the classic to post classic when other sites nearby were largely abandoned. The focus of this paper is structure N1015 in the Ottawa group and its late to terminal classic building phases, a time when this particular building saw many remodeling episodes. To set the stage, this is a period of more than 300 years when new construction activity had diminished in the central precinct and other areas of the site. However, construction was ongoing throughout Lamini's occupation. Plaza N103, the Ottawa Plaza Courtyard Group, is considered a palace or elite residential administrative group. Pendergast has remarked that although this complex was likely multi-purpose, it must have served some residential function too, although a functional analysis of the structures based on the associated artifacts was impossible because the floors were swept clean at the time of abandonment. Although opinions vary about the placement of burials and caches in residential buildings, the absence of any burials in N1015 may suggest that 15 was not a residential building. In the late classic, the Ottawa group was composed of six range structures. N1017 and N1077 opened directly onto the plaza floor, while the third structure at the east end, Tulip, N1028, rests upon a single terrace. The three structures at the western end of the Ottawa group sat upon a triple-joined two-terrace platform that was higher than the Tulip platform. N1015 is the structure that sits on the northern part of this U-shaped platform. As we see it today from the south, courtyard side, structure 15 sits upon a 2.7 meter high two terrace platform. Although not visible now, as it was covered during the boulder phase of Ottawa, the height changed at the northeast corner to a 3.5 meter high two terrace configuration across the north and also west side. The southeast corner of 15 sits atop a buried lower terrace of Tulip, indicating that the plaza floor was once lower than it is presently. At the plaza side of 15, three eight meter wide steps led up to a fourth 11 meter wide stair side outset step with a fifth step up landing upon the upper terrace. The masonry characteristics of the stairs with large, a relative term, rectangular riser stones is different than the smaller irregularly sized and unevenly coursed facing stones in the terrace faces and the perimeter walls of 15 which may indicate that the stair was a subsequent modification to the original terrace. As for the construction of Structure 15, it saw numerous remodelings during its lifespan, many of which apparently involved the ripping out and rebuilding of the same feature in the same places. With the reuse of facing and other stones a common practice, this may account for why the facing stones appear to be reused in the building. There is a notable difference in the masonry style in one of the northern additions of 15, which could indicate different external stylistic influences or different task groups doing the work, but it may also just reflect centuries of remodeling. The focus of our 2014 excavations was to investigate the late to terminal classic period architectural sequence of structure N1015 in order to further clarify the 1980s work conducted by Pendergast and Lowton especially in the building additions at the north side, and to consider access patterns on the north side of the building. Where were the stairs, and how did access change as the building expanded? While it is impossible to unravel all of the remodeling episodes in the exact sequence of the additions to the original floor plan of N1015, we do know that additions were built both to the north, which we are calling N1015 the second, and to the west at the adjacent area previously designated as structure N1019, which shares a wall at the west end of 15. Each area went through several phases of remodeling and northward expansion, making it difficult to differentiate the two structures. Unfortunately, the evidence does not allow us to fully reconcile the timing of the changes that were happening at N1019 with the additions at 15, but we do know that they were both being expanded northward through time, either as a single building or as separate structures. Through our research, we have identified six major phases, 
or footprint transformations that took place after the initial building was constructed. Internal remodeling and redecorating appears to have been continuous through all phases, but those more minor changes are difficult to correlate and will not be discussed here. The illustrations that follow are of the north side of 15 where the expansion was taking place. Using Lotons and Pendergast monikers, sorry David, the primary building, which we have designated Phase 1, is Maze, the structure atop the Dahl platform, aka N1015 the first. The building with tandem rooms oriented on an east-west axis, flanked by transverse rooms. It was a masonry walled building, but no vault stones were found during excavations, so it is possible that it had a wooden roof, but there is no conclusive evidence either way. Phase two was the addition of a ramp or stair feature that overlay the second terrace to abut with the maze building. There is a masonry face at the sides of this feature, but no treads or risers remain, leaving us to guess this feature's purpose. It could have been a temporary ramp used for construction of the building or a stair for access to the north side. The scale of this feature is odd for a central stair, but we do not know if a midpoint stair landing might have existed is this area is presently buried beneath the boulders. The next phase, three, is the addition of a platform feature that seems to have been of primary importance, which we have nicknamed the box. This encompassed the ramp into a larger eight meter wide box-like platform. The three and a half meter high sides of this feature are plastered with very shallow delineations between each of the three terrace outsets. The top of the box is capped with a floor of very high quality construction with a parapet at the perimeter edges. Two steps were built as part of this feature to connect it to the central north door of the maze building. Two caches, to be discussed in more detail later, were placed in this feature and all indications are that they were cached in the box as it was being constructed and not later cut into it through the floor. The functional and symbolic implications of this platform should be considered, as it could have served as a theatrical stage for performance associated with this building. Following this, phase four was a fairly big construction undertaking, although it may have happened in two separate phases, with a northward building extension across all of N1015 and N1019, requiring a new terrace. This new terrace, Ike, was parallel to the original Dahl Terrace face and essentially at the same height, but three and a half meters further north, allowing for the construction of another linear set of rooms across the north side of Mays in Structure 19. Lowton noted that walls were built, but then later torn down in a remodeling, so we don't know what the initial Ike addition floor plan looked like. And then came a monumental construction effort, boulders, phase five with the filling of the entire plaza area to the north of 15 with boulders to bring it up to the level of the maze interior floor surface. Not only did this plaza floor raising event extend across the whole north side of the Ottawa group, but it also entailed the demolition of five of the masonry buildings in Ottawa and the boulder filling of the courtyard, all capped by a new floor that extended across the whole of Ottawa, leaving only 15 and 19 to sit level with this new floor surface. Access to 15 likely shifted to the northern edge of this new platform. Building atop the partially demolished north perimeter wall of N1015 II as the new plaza floor was completed outside, Scholar became the fifth building phase, with walls atop a new floor and aligning all the floor surfaces inside and outside the buildings. Following this, in phase six, there is evidence of yet a further expansion to the north at N1019 atop the new plaza floor. N1015 was also expanded to the east, although it was never clear how the erratically shaped footprint was to be interpreted, and this feature no longer exists. Ottawa was transformed, with new platforms erected across the new plaza floor, and at least for a time, N1015 was likely still in use concurrent with new perishable structures built on these low platforms. And in the end, 15 was raised to, possibly to become a platform supporting a thatched building. Now, to return to the caches previously mentioned. Caches are our primary source of dating for the construction sequences of 15. 
All caches encountered in 15 appear to be of terminal classic date, occurring most frequently centered in the door areas on the primary axis. Depending on orientation, this structure could have two primary axes, as the building center line seen from the north does not align with the center as seen from the south side, since 19 is not visible from this position. The bulk of the caches were found on the northern central axis, so we believe that this is the public face of the building and that the caches were dedicatory in nature. However, there was also a cache at the southern doorway. But with the placement of the latest axial cache, the axis of the building shifted more than two meters to the east, so 15 may have then been considered an entirely different building. In 2014, we encountered cache N101510 under the floor of the box feature at the foot of the two steps. This cache featured lip-to-lip -lip polychrome dishes filled with large charcoal fragments, nine unremarkable white stones, and five obsidian lancets, all nested in a bed of charcoal. Based on the arrangement of stones above the first cache, we suspected that this cache area continued to the west. There, below the level of the first cache, was a large deposit of charcoal in which the base and some sherds of a highly fragmented, a shoti black cylindrical vase was found among three intentionally placed burnt stones a few centimeters under the uppermost surface of the charcoal deposit. Near the bottom of the mass of charcoal, we found one large jade bead, situated as if it had been casually tossed in with the charcoal, which appears to have been burned elsewhere and subsequently placed here upon the lower terrace of Dahl platform during construction of the box. Although we know from ceramic evidence that these caches both date to the Terminal Classic period and are similar to other caches found throughout Ottawa, we cannot pin down a date more precisely at this time. As stated at the beginning, our work at N1015 builds upon the strong foundations of Pendergast and Lowton's previous excavations at this structure, and they detected many of the architectural phases we have discussed. But our study of their drawings, photographs, and notes, coupled with additional excavations, has given us a better understanding of the architectural sequence of 15 and allowed us to compile this information into a more comprehensive format for the first time since 15 was originally excavated. What the architectural construction phases suggest is that 15 stood on important ground and whether or not it was continuously occupied by the same group or whether it maintained the same function throughout the socio-political situation in the late to terminal classic period at Lamini was strong enough to support a continuous building effort here, and one in the final phase that took an enormous amount of resources and labor. The transformation of the Ottawa complex may represent an architectural adaptation to a new ideology at Lamini, and the outcome of the boulder infilling may have resulted in much greater public access to the buildings situated upon this now grand single platform. We postulate that this move to inclusivity contributed to Lamini's persistence while other sites were being abandoned. We now have a better understanding of the construction sequence of N1015. What we don't know, however, are the precise dates that all this construction activity took place within a possible 300-year range. So if we return to Lamini next season with a high-tech datometer, perhaps we can begin to make more accurate temporal comparisons of the construction activities across Lamini and across the region.